Demelza. Demelza is the next speaker. She is the head of research at Cointelegraph. And for those of you who don't know, Cointelegraph is basically, I don't know, the financial times of blockchain, Bitcoin, kind of like the financial times in the crypto industry. And um, she's holding a presentation on how blockchain enables new economies. Demelza, the stage is yours. Thank you, Zani. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Julian, for getting everybody prepared and getting everyone on the same page. And thank you, Zani, for having me. Um, yeah, this is a great opportunity. And I mean, basically, uh, my name is Demelza Hayes, and I am the director of research at Cointelegraph. That is the largest cryptocurrency media company in the world. We get about 17 million views per month. And uh, since 2013, I've published about 30 practitioner publications, and a collection of them are available at uh, research.cointelegraph.com. I'm also launching a new and exciting uh, actively managed cryptocurrency certificate with a local family office here in Zurich called Zeltner & Co. Uh, so I'm also really excited about that opportunity. Okay, so we're all here for one reason today. And that's because we are witnessing the complete reformation of our monetary order that has been in place for the last 80 years. Every day, a new person comes online to learn about Bitcoin and to buy Bitcoin. With Bitcoin, you can, and the Lightning Network, you can buy a coffee like you could with a Visa credit card. You can also, with Bitcoin, send a remittance to Italy to send a salary home to your family. But as Jack Mahlers pointed out, you cannot use a Visa credit card to send home a remittance, and you cannot use Western Union to buy a coffee. Somehow, this Bitcoin uh, little b and Bitcoin big b has managed to combine all of these fragmented functions of our current traditional monetary system. However, there's so many different reasons why people use Bitcoin. Bitcoin is everything to everyone. So, you know, Bitcoin basically would allow you to leave a country with all of your wealth in your pocket, with a 16-word passphrase in your brain if you can't keep your treasure or ledger or paper wallet in your wallet. Bitcoin would also allow corporations to store assets offshore. Bitcoin would allow for the Vatican to get their, uh, you know, missions that are on the farthest edges of the globe, that are unbanked. It allowed them to get resources to them so that they can buy goods and services and food and supplies. Bitcoin would allow a government to take back control of their reserve assets if they don't want to have those reserve assets stored with a foreign power that might be able to freeze those assets. There's a million reasons why people use Bitcoin, and for every person, it's different. And every day, a new person, a new company, and a new government comes online to learn about Bitcoin and to buy Bitcoin. And the question is, do you want to buy Bitcoin before they come or after they come? Um, because it is a network, right? And networks all work the same way. The early entrants have the most to gain, and the latest people that join the network have the most to lose. So how is this possible with just one technology? How are all these different use cases possible? This is because the blockchain enables all of us to agree on just one single truth. It doesn't matter what your political opinion is. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter how old you are. We all know which accounts how, hold how much Bitcoin. Being able to agree on a decentralized and single truth will lead to all financial assets eventually being held on the blockchain technology. This is my thesis. And why is this the case? This is the case because 
the blockchain technology basically allows financial assets to become digital bearer assets. Okay, so if you all recall basically how bearer assets used to work, you had your bond, you had your coupon, you could ship in your coupon and get your payments out to you. You didn't have to have anyone you know, verify who you were in order to get your coupon payment. If your grandma left the bonds in the attic and you got them and you, you know, had bonds on the railway in, in America and you could sh keep shipping those coupons in. And also cash is a type of bearer asset, right? I just give you the cash, it's settled, it's done. Nobody else has to clear that transaction, settle that transaction, approve that transaction. And that is what's happening with Bitcoin. Um, and now imagine if we take that digital bearer asset capability and expand it to all financial assets, stocks, bonds, you know, and everything else. So due to this new ability to have non-confiscatable digital assets, the strength of our property rights has increased significantly. And this is why we are seeing a reformation of our monetary order. It is a, it is a renaissance of money that is going to bring the world back to sound money. And that is going to change everything, including our culture, I believe. Because our culture, I think, has you know, followed a path over the last 50, 60 years across the globe uh, correlated to interest rates. Uh, that basically make you have a higher time preference. Um, so all forms of assets that have weaker property rights are now going to have to compete with these assets that have higher property rights. And this is how the blockchain is creating new markets and new opportunities and enabling new economies. Now there's many different economies that the blockchain has created, but I'm just going to touch on a few, on three here. So the first market that comes to mind is the ability to have non-confiscatable digital bearer assets in the capital market. So the blockchain technology allows lenders and borrowers to meet from across the world and to basically clear and settle loans without any intermediaries. Um, right now, the global value of all fiat currencies, depending on how you measure that, if you look at the M3, it's about 120 trillion. Cryptocurrencies hit about 3 trillion, so it's about 2.5% of that market. We still have a while to go, but investors like Michael Saylor from MicroStrategy, uh, President Bukele from El Salvador, uh, even uh, Do Kwon of Terra Luna, are just buying Bitcoin at every opportunity they get, right? So right now we see that Do Kwon is buying 125 million worth of Bitcoin every day. He wants to have uh, 3 billion within a short span of time. All of his transactions are visible online. The price is going up, you know, you know I don't know, we've had, what, 7K increase in price in the last two weeks uh, because of this buying activity. And he wants to buy 10 billion in total to back his UST stablecoin. So, I mean, you have people that are actively increasing this market capitalization. Um, and it is expected to reach 5 trillion by the end of this year. Now, the second market that will greatly benefit from the ability to have digital bearer assets is the global securities market. So two of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges, FTX and Binance, are already offering tokenized securities. And, you know, it might not seem that amazing in countries like Switzerland or in countries like the US that have advanced, uh, you know, uh, regulation and structure for securities markets and we have strong property rights. But Im imagine in regions where they're capital markets and access to investments isn't that robust. They don't actually have many opportunities. All of these people can now come online and buy the stock of a US or Swiss or English or you know, uh, any country. They can buy a stock in that company. And the thing is, is that this is going to basically incentivize people all around the world to increase their savings rate. Because now, instead of having no opportunity for their surplus capital. They're going to have a, 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 a world, you know, wide 
universe of investments. So I think that this is going to really, you know, draw a lot of capital from regions that don't currently have access to, you know, uh, securities markets that are protected by strong property rights and, and enforcement of contracts. So even, you know, even in, in Switzerland, basically they have uh, FTX is using uh, like a, 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 tied, a tying agent to basically issue these stocks. And, you know, people might say, well, there's too many, you know, regulations and, and my bank can't do this. My bank can't, you know, allow people to have digital bear stocks. Well, this is how the trickle down is going to happen because you're going to have an, an, an app on a phone from a country that's really tiny somewhere that allows people to basically have full control over their stocks and they can send them between exchanges. And then what's going to happen is that's going to attract a lot of users because now they can charge an interest rate for whenever they lend out their stocks. Right? So th these different exchanges are going to have to compete for their stocks. When, when, um, when, when Sam Bankman Friedman, who's the uh, founder of Solana, uh, billionaire Forbes 30 under 30, when, when he was asked, where is this market going? Where is this tokenized security market going? He said, it would be powerful to be able to freely move tokenized stocks on the blockchain. But as of now, FTX, and the German financial services firm CM Equity do not support that. They remain on FTX, a tied agency to CM Equity. Of course, that's changed. They're now using Conco Game by Ha uh, in Switzerland. But the idea is there, right? That we have digital bear assets that we have full control over. And that trickle down will happen through competition, all the way up to the point where your local retail bank will, you know, you know basically be forced. Uh, to, to basically give users the same experience that they get from cryptocurrencies. That's going to be applied to all other financial assets. Okay, now the third market that I think uh, we, we can see is greatly benefiting from this digital bear asset status is gaming. This, I know this was one that maybe a lot of people don't play video games. Uh, I stopped playing video games a while ago. But it's actually created an entirely new market because you have people um, that are in countries that have low wages and they're spending 60 hours on a blockchain-based game building up a, a sword or something like that. And then they're selling it to people in countries that have a, a higher, you know, average wage and you have you know, the David Ricardo uh, uh, comparative advantage just playing out in these, in these games where you basically see certain countries specializing in the intent, labor-intensive work and then these other countries uh, j that just want to have, a, 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 you know, enjoy playing and have capital, they just buy in these, these uh, in-game assets. And then you can actually trade these in-game assets for cryptocurrencies, which you can then sell and use to buy real goods and services in the real world. So I think eventually, you know, it's going to get to the point where gamers demand that their virtual efforts yield returns in the physical world. Um, and, and a lot of people will say, well, there's no good games right now and they're low quality. Well, one of the projects I'm working with is just going to the good quality games like Call of Duty and Fortnite and also solitaire and, and uh, you know, all the, you know, little kind of easy to play games. And just getting the licensing from those games to build them on the blockchain. So they are just slowly going to port over all of those games into blockchain. And then eventually, why would you play a game that doesn't, that doesn't you know, have some kind of property right for you? you? You don't have any property rights over the work that you've done. So... I think, you know, there's a lot of different areas, but these are three, three markets where we've already seen huge amounts of money invested, lots of projects and companies uh, coming into this space. Uh, and, I, and I think it's just going to, I think ga gaming and game finance is going to be one of the big topics for 2020, uh, 2022. <laughs> and the other thing about, you know, as, uh, as Julian mentioned, you know, the 60 million for an ape. I know there's fans of NFTs here and... I 
wrote a report on NFTs earlier this year, but I don't think the, 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 you know, all that demand for that NFT is because people really want their Twitter avatar to be an ape. I think it's because it's a digital bearer asset. This is the first time we've had full control over our wealth. In, it, I, not certainly during my generation, I haven't, I haven't seen that. Um, I don't even think during my dad's generation, probably during my grandparents' generation, they had a lot more um, control over their wealth. But that was, that was not part of, part of my life until now. So I, I am happy to buy an NFT because I get access to a market that I wouldn't otherwise, right? I get access to new opportunities. Um, so, our, our estimate at Cointelegraph is that approximately 100 million people use Bitcoin, uh, nearly 300 million people use cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, and Crypto.com, uh, which is one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges, estimates that about 1 billion people will be using crypto by the end of this year. So, I mean, if you look at any of the trends in the crypto space, you can just see it's all the same, like, line that goes up. You know, it's just that same little hockey stick line next to almost any aspect of this crypto space. Um, and, and again, the question is, will you gain exposure to digital assets before all of these people come in or after all of these people come in? Uh, you know, in the... In the future, I really think that my local bank will allow everyone to earn interest by uh, lending out their cryptocurrencies. They will earn interest by lending out their tokenized Tesla stocks. I'll be able to use my cryptocurrency as collateral for a mortgage to buy a home. I will be able to use cryptocurrency that is linked to my smartphone so that I can make payments directly from my smartphone on uh, the Lightning Network with fiat. So if you look at what Jack Dorsey's doing, uh, you know, the, he's trying to get fiat payments onto, I mean, basically stable coins linked to fiat. So basically, you know, uh, dollar-backed payments on the, on the Lightning Network. Because, you know, his idea is kind of like you want to save your hard assets and spend uh, assets like the, the dollar, um, which, you know, are being printed. I think, I think the estimate I heard recently was it's about $10 million per minute is what the U.S. is printing. So you fact check me on that, but that's what I, I recently read. It's a, it's a very high number. So, um, yeah, so, again, the question is, is, you know, do you want to join this network and be part of the early entrants that benefit the most, or do you want to you know, wait and see what happens and possibly lose out on, on further gains. Um, if you want to get involved early, feel free to reach out to me and Zeltner and & Co. And we will uh, be happy to talk to you further. So thank you very much.